the heart and soul of what I'm going to teach you this morning is going to be lay it down and let go of it. Uh, so there is definitely a theme there that we need to be mindful of. And the reason I always bring that up is because that way we understand that God is speaking to us in a very profound way. It's more than just, okay, that's a sermon. More than, okay, that was a prophecy. More than, okay, that was a tongue and interpretation. More than, okay, this was on somebody's heart. But when we realize that there's a theme, then we realize that God is moving in our midst. And God is speaking to us about something. And it will take me a little bit this morning to get there, but you're going to see in a short period of time that what God is, is, is speaking to us about as far as laying it down. And, uh, John chapter 15, and this will be, I think, about our third week on that. John chapter 15. Hey, Rachel, don't forget to mention Pastor Callahan. Uh, John chapter 15, verse number 7. And uh, it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now your first response may be, how in the world does that have anything down to do with laying it all down, letting go of it? As we get into the scriptures today, the teaching of it, you're going to see that's exactly where we're going. Exactly the heart and soul of primarily what I'm teaching this morning is lay it down and let go of it. But first we're going to start out with the first word there, if. Now that's a big word, isn't it? If. If. We can stop right there, and that tells us something. Anytime we see the word in the word of God, we see the word if. That's implying something, that there are conditions that we need to meet. That's telling us there's something that we need to do. That's telling us that that's what is called or referred to as a conditional promise. In other words, God is saying, I promise you this, that if you do something, this is what's going to happen. I promise you that if you do this, the end result's going to be this. So God is telling us here that this is a conditional promise. And uh, we, we can, you know, many things in life are that way. We have a job and they say, well, you know what? I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. I'm going to give you 40 hours worth a week. That means at the end of the week, your check's going to be an $800 gross check. Um, so, but there's a difference implied there, isn't there? You, if you show up to work, if you actually work those hours, at the end of the week, you're going to have this check. Now, if you don't show up for work, and you show up on whatever the payday might be, say Friday, and you haven't been to work all week, you say, I'm here for my check. Well, then you haven't met the condition. You're not qualified to receive the check at that point in time because you haven't done what the condition was. Now, you might say the same thing. You go and get a loan for uh, a new house, and they say, you know what? In, in 30 years, this house will be paid off. It'll belong to you, and we'll pass and hand you the deed. There's a condition there, though, isn't there? If you pay for it. If you make your payments. Now, if you just happen to show up in 30 years and say, okay, I'm here for the deed, you're not going to receive it, are you? So a lot of times people do that with the Lord, though. They don't stop and consider that there's an if there. There's conditions to be met. God is instructing us and teaching us here that if we do something, then we're going to see a certain result. There's a lot of scriptures that are used that begin with an if. First John 1 9 is one of them. Is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it begins with an if. If we confess our sins. And we can go to 2 Chronicles 7 14. It begins with an if, doesn't it? If my people shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, what's going to happen? God's going to heal the land. But it begins with an if. So there's a lot of scriptures, beloved, in the Bible that if we look at it, it begins with the word if, and any time we see the word if, we need to be mindful. Okay, God is about to give me a promise here, and if I do what he tells me to do, if I meet the conditions he lays out, I can rest assured that that promise will be manifest in my life. I can remember one time years ago, and it, it was just one of those things that stuck out in my mind, and God really spoke to me during it, I guess, and I was preaching a sermon at a church, and in all honesty, I haven't been preaching very long at all, and, and I always tell people, when I first started preaching, I didn't know much heart at all. I really didn't. I mean, I was thrown to the wolves, and uh, I really learned on the fly as far as learning God's Word, studying God's Word. Whatever I was preaching on at a certain 
Sunday or whatever, I was probably studying it to learn it myself during the week and then preaching it on Sunday. And, and there was a time I got up and I hadn't preached much and I preached a sermon. And I remember I was going on and on in this sermon about one person was healed and one person wasn't. We didn't know why. We didn't understand why. And there was this uh, elderly evangelist there who was listening to me. And after the service, he says, come here. I walked over to him and I thought, he says, it's because they didn't meet the condition. And what are you talking about? He says, that's why they weren't healed. One met the condition and they were healed. One didn't meet, did meet the condition and they were healed. Okay. And, and what that just exploded inside of me, though, at that time. I thought, well, yeah, that's simple, isn't it? God does give us conditions to be healed, doesn't he? If we pray the prayer of faith, we'll be healed. So there are conditions. So we're looking at a scripture at moments that the word if shows up. We should automatically, in our mind, think, what are the conditions? What are they? Because there's a lot of times in the scriptures we find very serious matters that, that, that God's people didn't meet the conditions and there were serious consequences. There was a time in the book of Ezekiel where, Ezekiel where God said he sought for a man to be an intercessor and couldn't find any because he didn't want to pour out his wrath upon the nation for their sins. But since he couldn't find anybody to be an intercessor, he had to pour out his wrath. Implying that if man would have met those conditions, if they would have sought God, if there would have been an intercessor there, that things would have been different. So God is laying out some kind of a purpose and a, and a promise and saying, if my people will do this, then here will be the end result. If my people will do this, then here will be the end result in their prayer life. And it's important that we're not talking about works or earning anything, Christ paid the price for everything that you and I will ever need throughout eternity. Ephesians 1, 3 says that God has supplied all of our, all of the riches according to riches. His riches, I mean, Ephesians 1, 3. Getting tongue-tied here. Ephesians 1, 3. I quote that all the time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So he's already blessed us with all blessings. So we don't need to earn those blessings, we need to receive those blessings. But sometimes there are laid out conditions that we need to receive those blessings. And if we want to have a prayer life that is powerful, that is mighty, if we want to have a prayer life where we're seeing the answers come forth, then we need to understand the conditions. One thing I want to interject here. You do understand that, and I remember years ago I, I taught a sermon, and it was just one of those sermons that everybody kind of responded on to. And the title of the sermon is that answered prayer is not a miracle. And everybody looked at me like, what are you talking about? Answered prayer is not a miracle. I said, no, answered prayer is not a miracle. I mean, what's a miracle? A miracle is something that doesn't, you don't think of happening all the time. But according to God's word, answered prayer should be normal, not miraculous. Hallelujah. Answered prayer, according to God's word, should be normal. We should be surprised when our prayers aren't answered, not surprised when they are. Because the word of God promises us right here that, that if we meet these conditions, our prayers will be answered. How often? Every time. Prayer, answered prayer is normal Christian living. When we pray and we don't receive an answer, we should immediately go to God and find out what's wrong, Lord. The same way as a light switch, if we turn a light switch on and the lights don't come on, the first thing you wonder is why is it not working? Do I need a light bulb? Do I need to fix the switch? Did I pay the electric bill? What have you? But that should be our prayer life. Answered prayer should be normal for a Christian. Answered prayer should be normal for a believer. There's nowhere in the Word of God that tells us anywhere that God answered prayer once in a while. <laughs> that God answered prayer every hundred years. It says here, we're going to get into this. If we meet the conditions. So you might say, what are the conditions, Pastor? Let's go back to John chapter 15. There are three conditions in this one verse. Three conditions in this one verse. If you abide in me. Condition number one is that we abide in him. And my words abide in you. Condition number two is that God's word abides in us. And you ask. Condition number three is that we ask. Now, you can abide in him, the word can abide in you, and you cannot ask and never receive. 
So there are three conditions we need to be concerned with as we abide in Him. His Word abides in us, and that we ask. So we're going to just talk about this for a minute. What does it mean to abide in Him? Now, a lot of people will read these verses and say, well, I'm saved, so I abide in Him. And, and, and that word abide there is, it is a lot different than that. That word abide there is used because it, it, it includes not only relationship, but it includes your home. That's where you dwell. That's where you continue. That word there is, that Greek word, as I read to you, I think last week, went to the chapter, and everywhere where the word abide is, I changed it to continue to demonstrate a point. That word there is quite often translated continue from the Greek to the English. But here it's translated abide. So it's, it's, it's talking about a place where you dwell, a place where you live. It's talking about your home. The thing that I often use as an example is, is the difference between your home and a motel room. The difference between your home and a campground. Or what have you. I mean, when me and Rachel, we go and travel somewhere occasionally, and we go to Verde Route or some places, sometimes we stay in a week at a time. We, we go there, we, we rent a motel room for a week, and we stay in that room for a week, and, and, and we kind of make ourselves at home, but we don't abide there. We're still just a visitor. We're just there for a few days. We're, we're not really dwelling there or living there. When we go to work around in Lexington, it's not our hometown. It's a place we're going to visit. Even though we're there, Pekin is still our hometown. This is where we live, and this is where we dwell, and this is where we abide. So it's talking about something more than just being born again. It's talking about an ongoing, active, present relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, well, doesn't that include every Christian? You know, there's a lot of people, and I refer to them in my own mind as crisis Christians. And they're the kind of person that, you know, we'll have them show up at church, and, and they'll come to me and, oh, Pastor, this is wrong, and that's wrong, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and I know I'm not going to get my life right and come back to church when you pray for me. And you do. You pray for them. And they're in two or three services, and then you never see them. And then a year down later, then another crisis of my life has left me and my dog died on the same day. We can pray for me. I've got to get right with God. And they do. And you don't see them for six more months. I lost my job. I can't pay the electric bill. I've got to get right with God. Will you pray for me and pay for the electric bill? I mean, it just, and there are people like that. That their walk with God, their relationship with God, it means that as long as things are going okay, God, you're not, you know, I don't pay that much attention. But as soon as I get into a crisis, God, I try to, oh, God, where are you? That person doesn't qualify for that verse. It's talking about those who abide in him. Those who live in him. Those who continue in him. Those who dwell in him. Those who have an ongoing, present relationship, active and living and dwelling in him. So it's not a once in a while crisis, is Christian. Abide in him implies relationship. You see, we keep in mind the context of the verses that we're studying in John chapter 15. It's teaching us how to bear fruit. It's teaching us how to be fruitful. Verse 4 tells about how we bear fruit. And verse 5 tells us to bear much fruit. And, and verse 6 says we, the limbs that don't bear fruit are cast forth and so on and so on. You see, the number one key to bearing fruit is relationship with Him. An ongoing, abiding, <laughs> dwelling relationship with Him. We were talking about that in, in our, our prayer time in Sunday school time. When we go back there, we've been sharing about prayer and spending time in prayer. And, and, and the Bible tells us that, you know, if we regard iniquity in our heart, that He doesn't hear our prayers. Why? Because there's separation. That relationship is hidden. And we went through the Lord's Prayer, and, and there's like, what well, we say, seven verses in the Lord's Prayer, I think it was, and three of the seven deal with forgiveness, of, or asking God to forgive us and forgive others. Why? Because that relationship can't be hindered. We have to have a, a, an active, present, good, ongoing relationship. We go into the presence of God. We go into the Holy of Holies. We are abiding and dwelling and living in Him. If if you abide in me, 
It was Jesus who, who said basically that, that, uh, that he doesn't do anything but what he sees the Father do. He doesn't do anything but what he heard the Father do. In other words, Jesus had that ongoing active relationship with the Father. And he's spending time with the Father. The Father saying, Jesus, go, go over here. There'll be a man with a withered hand. Tell him to stretch it forth. And, and Jesus, go over here. And there's going to be a man who can't walk. Tell him to rise up and walk. In other words, everything, all the fruit that was born in Jesus' life here on the earth, and all the fruit that was born in his ministry came as a result of him abiding in the Father. And that ongoing relationship with the Father, when the Father says, do this. The great example that I've always used about that in the church is, is Acts chapter 13. And Acts chapter 13 was when they, they gathered and they began to praise. And they began to pray and fast and seek the face of God. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke to them and, and said, send Saul and, 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 and send him out here. And, and they began to go out and do the work of the ministry. And great fruit came forth where that fruit was born was in that time dwelling and abiding in the presence of God and seeking his direction. If you abide in me. If you abide in me. If you abide in me. There's a phrase I ran across this last week and I thought it was pretty powerful when it talks about exactly what we're talking here. It was, it was really talking to people who are pastors or in, in that capacity leadership in the churches. And the point was, I forget the exact phrase, but it was recognizing, not organizing. And, and the point that he was making was that we need to recognize what God is doing and flow with that, not try to organize what we want to do. And to do that, we have to be abiding, don't we? We have to be dwelling and living in his presence. Keep in mind, beloved, answering prayer is normal. People are saying, hey, I'm too crazy to say that. Answered prayer is normal. If our prayers aren't being answered, then something is wrong. Our prayers should be answered as often as the light comes on when we hit the switch. That's what the Word teaches us. But what has happened over the years, we've gotten so religious brain forced, I guess you could say, that we think when God answers a prayer, that's an amazing miracle. Woo! That should be normal. Hallelujah. I mean, when you look at the promises of God's word, it's phenomenal the power that is invested in us in our prayer life. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done every thousand years. It shall be done every hundred years. It shall be done in times of great revival. It shall be done once in your life, and you can make a plaque and hang it on your wall if you remember it every day. It shall be done unto you. So it shall be, it shall be done unto you. Does that mean every time? But you see, we spent a lot of time trying to come up with all kinds of theological explanations why prayer wasn't answered, rather than going to the Word and thinking, okay, there's a couple conditions here. If I abide in Him, His Word abides in me. And I ask, it will be done. That's what it says, doesn't it? If I abide in him, and his word abides in me, and I ask, it shall be done. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> Every thousand years. See, here's what I think the kicker is. I think the first one. A lot of people got that. I think the second part, a lot of people struggle. You're going to find it's an amazing thing. Remember what we were talking about when I started? Lay everything down. Let go. We're going to a scripture that's going to show us that that's how that happens.
For this to be on, on the inside of us, not a family heirloom sitting on the coffee table with grandma's and grandpa's names in it. That's fine if you have that. But, but the Word of God is meant to be in us. The Word of God is meant to be alive on the inside of us. And that is one of the conditions of an effective prayer life. You see, you can go in the Old Testament. And, and I've really been kind of just chewing on this this week. And, and, and throughout the Old Testament, clear back at the very beginning, God spoke about putting His Word in our heart. Remember the prophet Ezekiel, how he took the scrolls and God said, take the scrolls and eat it? And he took the scrolls and eat it and said it was sweet as honey to him? That was typical of, of us taking the word of God and putting on the inside of us. Clear back in the early days of the law with the book of Deuteronomy, God told them to take his word and put it in their heart. He says, when you put it in your heart, then talk about it. Teach your children. Talk about it everywhere you go. Talk about it everywhere, everything you do. Even write it on your gates and write it on the fence post and write it on your door and write the word of God and just let it be the thing that you talk about day in and day out. Let it be the thing that you meditate about day in and day out. Let that word of God dwell richly on the inside of your heart. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, he even told them if you do that, it will be as day of heaven on earth. All the way back from the beginning, God's plan has been for the word to be on the inside of his people. Hallelujah. But you see, beloved, over the years, the word of God has been greatly under attack. And I'm not standing here to criticize anybody, but th there's a lot of churches that don't even teach the word. So how are people going to get it on the inside of them? So that's the question. And Lord, you, you, you tell me to, to put the word of God in my heart? You told them in the book of Deuteronomy to put the word of God in their heart and teach it to their kids and talk about it all day during the day when they go about their business? You tell me here that if I abide in you and your word abides in me, I will ask what it will, and it be done unto me? Well, Lord God, how do I get the word from the coffee table into my heart? How do I do that? Do I memorize it? Do I sit and just have memories? I mean, that's great if you do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's more to it because I know people who, who memorize the Word of God. I know people who can quote the entire New Testament to you, and I wouldn't tell you that the Word of God's at their heart. How do I get it, Pastor, in my heart? And by the way, what in the world does this have to do with laying everything down? Go to the book of James, chapter 1. Look at James, chapter 1. It tells us how to put God's word in our heart. God didn't leave us hanging. Who knows? God doesn't ever leave us hanging, does he? I mean, he tells us, how to, he tells us to do something. You can rest assured that somewhere in the word, he's going to tell us how to do that. He doesn't expect us to figure stuff out. He makes it simple. He tells us how to do it. And, and these verses are probably one of the number one reasons that people are not getting the word into their heart. The Bible tells us, in James chapter 1, and this is kind of colorful, King James verse. This is the one verse in the entire Bible I think sounds more King James than any verse in the Bible. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of godliness. Now there's a phrase we don't often use. I don't think even Englishmen say superfluity of godliness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Let me read that to you out of the Amplified. It makes it a little bit more easy. Get rid of all the uncleanness. Lay it all down, remember? And rampant outgrowth of wickedness. And in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. There's two things in there that it tells us to do. Get rid of, lay down, remember that? And receive with meekness. 
here's how I think that, that is I'm understanding the Lord here on this. This is where this is really key. How we perceive his word is of the utmost importance. A lot of people will tell you, Ooh, Pastor, I believe the Bible. I believe it all the way from Genesis to the end of Revelation. Glory to God, I believe every word of it. And what they really mean is I believe that it's historically true. I believe, that, I believe that Jesus did that. I believe that Jesus healed those people. I believe Jesus said those words. I believe Noah built an ark. And you're believing this is an accurate historical document. That's one way to believe the word, isn't it? And a lot of people, if you really will talk to them and question them a little bit, you'll find when they say they believe the Bible, that's what they mean. Oh, you believe the Bible. It says we lay hands on sick, they shall recover. So you lay hands on the sick and they recover. Well, no, we believe Jesus did that. We believe the apostles did that. See, there's a difference believing the Bible is an accurate historical record and believing the Bible, listen to me here, I'm going to show this to you in the Word, believing the Bible is what God has given us in order to live a blessed life. Now, if you approach the Word of God, you can stand there, be theologically correct and accurate. I believe the Bible. I believe every word of it. Say, I believe the Bible is accurate history. That's really what happened. Every word is right. Every word is correct. I believe the Bible. It's different than saying, I believe the Bible. I believe every word of it is teaching me how to live a blessed life. Because if I'm looking at this as a handbook of life, and something that God gave me to teach me to walk a blessed life, something God gave me to teach me to walk in victory, then I'm more than willing to lay down anything that's contrary to the word so I can live the word. But a lot of people, beloved, and are looking because I believe that's a historical document. That's true. Jesus did those things. Jesus said those things. The apostles did those things. The apostles said those things. The prophets did those things. The prophets said those things. I believe every word God spoke the universe into existence. I believe every bit of it is historical, accurate history. And they can believe that and continue to live their life how they want to live. And not lay anything down. And still be active. They're still correct. They believe it's true. They believe Jesus did those things. They believe Jesus healed people. They believe the apostles did those things. They believe every word of it. But they're not looking at it as a way to live a blessed life. So they're really not wanting to apply it to their life. And that's one of the greatest revelations for a Christian to get. This is God's plan for my life. To live his word. To lay down everything that's contrary to it so I can live the word. This is an instruction book for life. Not a history book. There's a world of difference, isn't there? I mean, I believe Abraham Lincoln lived. I believe the historical, there's very accurate historical records of Abraham Lincoln's life. But I don't live my life according to Abraham Lincoln's words. This is a historical document, 100% correct. But my goal as a Christian is to live this way. And when I begin to look at it that way, then suddenly it begins to get in my heart. Because suddenly I'm willing to lay things down. Where I think contrary to the word, I realize I've got to change the way I think. Where I have emotions contrary to the word, I've got to change my emotions. Where I live my life contrary to the word of God, my actions are contrary to the word of God, I've got to change my actions. This is my handbook for life. And you can sit and watch anybody's life for about five minutes using and tell them which approach they take. Because there's a lot of people who can say, you know, the word says this, it just bounces right off of Well, that's nice. I believe that. That's accurate history. But I don't believe that's what I'm supposed to live my life. And I don't believe there's any consequences if I don't live my life that way. That's where a lot of people are at. Lay apart. So if we're truly, absolutely persuaded that what I just shared with you is true, then you're going to lay down anything that's in the way, aren't you? 
If you truly believe that what the Word of God says, that if we meditate on this day and night and it doesn't depart out of our mouth, then we'll have good success. Then we're going to be willing to lay anything down. If we truly believe Psalm 1, and if we meditate on the word day and night, we'll be like a tree planted by rivers of living water, and whatever we do shall prosper, we'll lay down our everything else in our life that's contrary to the word. If we truly believe this is a way to live life, then we'll lay everything down. But if we're just looking at it as a history book, then we'll say, I believe every word, praise God, go to church every Sunday, believe every word. And it won't be in our heart. It'll be a historical document on our shelf. Hallelujah. Praise the pastor. Good stuff. Receive the word with meekness. This is so key. As I read the definition of this word meekness, there's one part of it that just lit up on the inside of me. I said, that's it, Lord. I get it. And it's very simple. Let me read the definition to you. See, because I'm curious why the Word of God's not inside more believers. I'm curious why it's not alive on the inside more folks. Meekness. We accept His dealings with us as good. Wow. That's simple, isn't it? We accept His dealings with us as good. That goes right back to laying everything down. And I thought, you know, the reason that led up to me, I thought, you know, out of all the, the pastors, and I, I was looking at pastors' lives, and not just Christians, but uh, people who are in leadership, and I thought, Lord, out of all of them that I know, the one thing I can say, those who truly have the Word of God abiding in their heart are men and women who are persuaded of the goodness of God. And, and you will find that to be 100% true. Why? Because they accept what I just taught them. They don't look at this as a history book. They look at this as a way of life. That a good God is teaching them how to live a blessed life. And if we're not convinced of the goodness of God, if we think that God's going to get us, and God's a severe God, why would I want to obey His word and get, get balked? But when I'm convinced of the goodness of God, and God's desire to teach me how to live a blessed life, then I'm willing to lay everything down. I'm willing to put everything down because I know that God's will is the ultimately the good will for my life. And I see this all the time when people say, Pastor, that's just not what I feel. Well, if you ever get the revelation, beloved, and a person gets a revelation that no matter what I feel, no matter what I think, that the good result comes when I obey God's word, even if I think contrary, even if I feel contrary, I know that if I obey God's word and meet the conditions of God's word, that's where the blessing lies, not where my emotions lead me, not where my thoughts lead me, where the word leads me. And when I realize that, that the goodness of God supersedes even my own thoughts and my own emotions, then I'm going to lay everything down to walk in the word. You see, it all gets down to how we look at this word. Beloved, if you were convinced, I'm not saying you're not, I don't mean it that way. If we were absolutely 100% convinced that every promise of this word belonged to us, we would devour this word like the prophet Ezekiel did. He took it, he devoured it, and it tasted sweet as honey. He didn't say it was bitter. He didn't say it was hard. He said it was sweet as honey, beloved. And when we get the word of God on the inside of us, it is sweet as honey. This is the words of life, beloved. that would hinder that 
anything that would stand in the way and to walk in his word. So he can do what? What did they pray for you about? What did you pray for about today? Live life to the fullest. How do you live life to the fullest? You live according to God's word and walk in his blessings. That's how it's done. By putting the word inside of our heart and living it to the fullest. Just like, we're, like let the army be all you can be. How you can be all you can be is live the word. You see, God said that Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And life what? More abundantly. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that I'll prosper and be in my health, even as thy soul prospers. The book of Jeremiah tells us that God and God's plans for us are good and not evil. We can go on and on and on and on about the riches and the goodness of God and the blessings of God. You see, beloved, Let's go back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. If, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and something's going to happen. You will ask what you will. And it shall be done. So there's conditions there. That abiding relationship. And the word of God abiding in us. And then we ask. You see, one thing that, that I, I kept hearing again today was, you're, you're the light. Did you hear that? And you see, when we're abiding in Him, and the Word's abiding in us, and we're asking what we will, and it's being done unto us, then that light is shining bright. Because you know what? There's something about that, that, that about a people who are walking in the Word and seeing the blessings of God manifest in the community, that the rest of the community sees that light. And you think, Pastor, that's good thinking, but is that Word looking for saying, Herein is my Father glorified? That you bear much fruit. So when we abide in Him, and His Word abides in us, and we ask what we will, and we and it is done unto us, and we're fruit bearing Christians, and the Father is glorified. God, show up your glory and peak it out. Oh my God said, Yeah, abide in me, let my word abide in you. Ask what you will, and I'll show up my glory. The means that He manifests His glory is through us. And through believing his word and living his word and walking in his promises, as we do that, God the Father is glorified in our community. God the Father is glorified in our city. God the Father is glorified in our family. God the Father is glorified wherever we go because we're walking in the blessings of God, because we're abiding in him and his word abides in us, and we're asking what we will, and they're seeing that happen in our life. And they're saying, wow, something's different there. And the Father is glorified when we bear fruit. I know, Pastor, but you don't realize this gets in my way. Lay it down. Get rid of it. But, Pastor, you don't realize what happened to me in 1992. Let it go. You don't realize how I was raised, Pastor. Let it go. Something soft, don't it? It is. Let it go. It actually is. I know it is. I got one little kid saying it. Kids used to sing it all the time. Little Rain, I think Jesus, I've heard Little Rain sing that at least a thousand times. <laughs> but you know what? That's good advice. If it's not God's word, get rid of it. Amen. It's that simple. Meditate on the word. Walk in the Word and let God pour His glory out in your lives. If you abide in me and my Word abides in you, you will ask what you will and 
shall be done. Did you realize, beloved, little phrase. And the Bible tells us in John that Jesus was the Word, and He became flesh. And we are flesh becoming the Word. We're predestined to conform unto the image of His Son. We are predestined to conform unto the image of the Word. As this Word abides in us, we get we become like Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. And then ask. Then simply ask. Hallelujah.